heading south of the Mason-Dixon. This is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is your host, Brian McClanahan, and this is episode 298, covering the week of February 21st through February 25th, 2022. Glad to have you back on the program. Very glad to be here. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter, like our Gab page, and subscribe to our YouTube page. You can find all those social media accounts at our webpage, abbevilleinstitute.org. That's A-B-B-E-V-I-L-L-E institute.org. While you're there, give us that email address. We'll give you a free ebook exploring the Southern tradition. It is our gift free to you just for giving us that email, at li- uh, email address. And of course, you get on our email list, which we send out an email about five days a week. Monday through Friday, generally, our daily dose of Dixie. So it's a way we can keep in touch with you. Also let you know about anything we're doing at the Institute, like our Zoom webinars, which we had on Thursday, a great Zoom webinar. The title of it was, Did Lincoln Sell Slaves? Or Lincoln, the Slave slave Owner. And so that was a great webinar. We had a a very good guest, uh, Dr. Kevin Johnson on there, who has a new book on the Lincoln White House. And it was a fantastic turnout. These are the kind of things we want to do to try to keep you informed. We also have our Douglas Rogers essay contest, which the deadline for that is the middle of March. So if you're an undergraduate student and you want some cash for college, just simply write an essay. It's a great opportunity for you to do that. So I would appreciate you looking at that. All that can be found on our webpage, abbevilleinstitute.org as well. So you go on out there. We've got the Douglas Rogers Essay Contest. You can find our Abbeville Academy where we have all of the replays for all these webinars we've had. If you missed any, you can purchase a replay for those. And that's yours for as long as we exist, right? So uh, you get it. You can download the video. You can download the audio. It's a great way to learn a little bit about what we do and who our scholars are. Uh, We've had uh, 12 webinars now. So that's a really fantastic, actually we've had more than that, but one we had an audio problem with, and I will get that one, I promise. It was on the Kennedy Twins, and I want to get that one back on there. So we had an audio video problem with that in the recording. So I have to redo it with them, and we'll we'll do that, and hopefully get that, to, get that up there in the near future, excuse me. <clears throat> also, download that mobile app on the webpage. Click on the mobile app at the top of the page. Just go to your uh, Google Play or your Apple Store and look for Abbeville Institute. You get the mobile app free of charge, free of charge for the mobile application. It's a great win-win for you. You can get our lectures there, our podcast, all of our articles. So it's a mobile access to the website. And again, free to you. Now that said, everything we do is supported by listeners, readers, people that support the Institute. So we exist on your generous contributions alone. So if you like all these things, we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization. So you can submit a donation. Just go to abbevilleinstitute.org, click on the Donate tab, or click on the Donate button right there, and you can give us some money. You can give us an annual gift, one-time gift, monthly gift, and no amount is too small, right? We do appreciate every contribution. So if you're on a tight budget, but you really like it, and you only want to give us five bucks a month, two bucks a month, three bucks a month, whatever you can can give to the cause, we appreciate it. We've got all kinds of plans for things moving forward. So all of it takes money, though. We've got opponents with a lot of cash, and we need more of it to do some of the things we want to do. So videos are a real key for us. We also have the Abbeville Press, which we're working on. A lot of great books through that. So a lot of things in the works for the future. But as always, rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast. Share it around on social media. Share our articles on social media. We may not be on Facebook anymore, but it doesn't mean you can't share our material on Facebook. So do that. Let us Let people know that you like the Institute. Get our embroidered material, just go to that shop tab. You can advertise the Institute that way. So lots of great ways to let people know you like us and you like what we do. Okay. All that said, I actually want to start this week with a piece from a first-time writer for us that we published on Thursday. And I want to start with this piece because it really exemplifies what the Institute is all about. If you go out onto social media and you go around the world, and all of us do, Many people feel so isolated and alone in their views on Southern history, Southern tradition. Now, maybe if you're in a small town in a very tight-knit community and you've got a good social network, maybe you don't feel that way. But I know a lot of Americans feel alone. I know Don Livingston himself has shared this story with me. And, of course, he's the founder of the Institute. 
And he said, you know, when I was growing up, they played Dixie when you flew on an airplane and you got to Atlanta, flying into Atlanta, that Dixie came over the came over the speakers. And I mean, it was something. It was, you know, you just felt like you're in the South. And his wife used to call the Confederate flag the Dixie flag. And I mean, that's what it was. It was an image and it had its own identity, its own feeling about it, right? There was a separate culture, a separate people. This was something else. And I think for many of these people growing up in that, they never thought it would ever go away. But really beginning in about the 1990s, you started to see all of that disappear, all that regional distinctiveness, all of the beauty around that just became ugly to everyone. I mean, Ben Jones talking about when he was in the Dukes of Hazard, and uh, they would drive the General Lee down through Atlanta, and all the people that would, hey, yeah, Dukes of Hazzard, General Lee, yeah. And all, I mean, black, white, it didn't matter. People loved it. It was a symbol of the South. And somewhere, because of education, sometime, it really began in the 60s moving forward, all of that came to mean bad. All of these things came to mean evil. And so anybody that likes these things very much feels alone. And I, I, I've told the story. I had a colleague that had the book, The South Was Right. And I remember seeing it in his office. And I said, yeah, you know that. And he, it was kind of like a, a code word. He saw that. I just saw the spine. You can't see anything. He saw the spine. But because he had that, either the person has it because they hate the South and they just want to laugh at it or they like it. So you kind of have to ask a few questions. But he liked it. And so there's an end, right? It's kind of a... Kind of a, uh, you know, this is my this is my in card. You know, this is my membership card to this. So, or there's other books that can do that as you see them with people. But that's kind of where you start feeling people out. You can't just be someone that's open about these things all the time anymore because of the environment in which we live. And it's a sad thing because being Southern is great. Uh, being, uh, enjoying the Southern tradition is a great thing. Uh, it's It's got such beautiful parts to it. It doesn't matter who you are, black or white, where you come from, where you live. We've got people that support this organization from all over the world, all over the United States, all over the world. And we get emails all the time. I really came across, I, there's so much about the Southern tradition I admire. There's so many things. We all know there's bad things about traditions. We all know that, right? We all know there's things we're not looking to emulate or, or really champion anymore. But I, I, as I've said on this show for now, nearly 300 episodes, a lot of that is not Southern anyways. Jim Crow originated in the North, for example. I mean, a lot of those things came out of a different mindset than the South. And racism was not uniquely Southern. I mean, that's not the Southern tradition. The Southern tradition is other things. And so there's a lot of things that we talk about, and there's a certain identity to it. It's not identitary in politics, but there's a certain identity to it, a tradition, a culture that people in an area gravitate to. It doesn't matter where you're from. This is what you gravitate to. And so that's what the Institute is about at, at its core. I've said on this show, I started saying it a long time ago, but the South is America. And there was a time that people recognized that when Jeffersonian America dominated and people thought of America as the South. That's what they thought of America. Now, the New England version of all of this would be against that entirely. And to them, the South would be, or, I'm sorry, the United States would be uh, John Brown and Abraham Lincoln and Puritan New England. It would be John Winthrop, shorn of all the religious stuff, but the political side of it. It would be Daniel Webster's vision of America. That would be America if you are looking at it from a New England perspective. The Pilgrims, not Jamestown. And that has filtered, of course, into elements of Protestant churches around America. You see it all the time. The, the, the Pilgrims were good. The Jamestown settlers were bad. The Puritans were good. The Jamestown settlers were bad. And people are taught this in their Sunday school instruction and in their theological instruction and in their religious education instruction. And it's the wrong thing to do. The people that settled in Jamestown were also good Christians. They were Anglicans. They weren't pilgrims or Puritans. They were Anglicans, but they were good Christians. Um, so that's the deception that we have. It's New England telling the story of America, and it's the wrong story of America. It's not the real story. It's why, and I'm going to tell you this now, we're working behind the scenes on something hard as we can to change that entire narrative. And there will be something about this, more information as we get closer to being able to actually have this fulfilled and come to fruition. But it's called the 1607 Project. And we're working on this. And the first part of it is Virginia First. 
you're going to see some more stuff about this. This is where, if you want to donate, we could use the cash to try to do this thing. It is going to hopefully transform the way that people think about America. As much reach as we can get with it, right? And we're going to try to publish, publicize it far and wide and let people know it's there. But that's something we're working on. But it's changing the vision of what America is. This is the core of the Institute. It's not just about the war. And people, I, I see it all the time when people comment on the Institute. It's usually in Civil War blogs or Civil War chats and other nonsense like that. We're just a bunch of lost causers supporting the Confederacy. The South has 400 years of history. And the Southern tradition is bigger than just the four years of the war. And so there's so many misconceptions about the South and so much about the South that's, that's uh, demonized and degraded and all these things because people don't know it. Or you've got neoconservatives that say the South was oligarchic and the North was democracy. Just completely stupid. It's the most idiotic, backwards position. But this is what people do. And you've got mainstream historians doing the exact same thing. Horrible stuff. So I'm, I'm all this long-winded stuff for about five minutes now on why I really like this piece that we published on Thursday from a new writer. His name is Chase Steely. He is a veteran and uh, lives in Tennessee, loves books. Uh, he, he's got a very interesting social media account where he talks about all the books and things that he, that he acquires. Um, and he's just a student of the South. He's not, he doesn't have a, a PhD doesn't have a master's degree. Doesn't have anything that you would think is, wow, this guy's a, a scholar. But he is a scholar because you look at what he reads and he's he knows more things about the Southern tradition than people that work in many Southern studies programs know. And so this piece is entitled Southern Distinctiveness. And I love it because, again, it embodies what the Institute really is all about at its core. All the stuff we do comes down to this, not feeling alone. So when we write stuff about the war, just to let you know, there's other people out there. You might think that you're the only one you know that has a different vision or version of what happened in 1861 to 65 than everyone else around you, but there's other people out there that think it. And, of course, the other side thinks there's you know legions of us. We know that there aren't as many as the, the boogeyman mentality they have, the straw man mentality. But So we've got that. Um. But the fact is, there's more people out there, and growing, by the way, and growing. I think that's the thing that they're afraid of the most. There's more people, and we're growing, and there's more of us than there used to be 20 years ago. There's not as many of us that there was at one time in America. That all kind of, I mean, because of education. But people are starting to find things because they're thinking to themselves, this isn't right, right? This this story that we're getting in, in K-12 through and college, there's got to be more to this. Curious minds want to know. There's got to be more to it. So this is, I'm going to read this piece because it's really good. It's not long. It's really good. He said, have you ever accidentally used the wrong mushrooms in a recipe, inducing you to think the South is some type of hallucination? Me neither. I reckon we aren't enlightened enough to grasp such concepts. Until recently, I never pondered ideas like regional consciousness or Southern distinctiveness. Truth be told, provincials seem too overdressed to feel comfortable among me, my hand-me-down vocabulary and not a not a soul told me Albion planted a seed. I wasn't around when that seed grew from a young whipper sapling into full-grown, yet I am acquainted with this peculiar southern fruit. Growing up in Tennessee, being southern was run of the mill, the raw state of being for everyone I knew, like the fish-water thing, not discussed or considered as far as I'm aware. But owing to several early encounters and six years in the army, I knew being southern was concrete enough to scrape your knee on. Southerners were distinct brought forth after their kind. It took me darn near 25 years to cross the Mason-Dixon line and 16 before traveling close enough to even trip over it. The waters of Leith couldn't expunge my memory of a visit to Johnny Rockets during that high school trip to Washington, D.C. Yep, Johnny Rockets. I learned I spoke with a southern accent at Johnny Flippin' Rockets. It only took me doing the most homespun and predictable thing when a waiter asked what I wanted to drink. I answered a sweet tea, please. You would have thought I fired on Sumter. The waiter, with a ha highfalutinous a Yankee can muster, replied, This ain't Dixie. We don't have sweet tea. Now, I've said this before. Let me pause here for a second. You really want to get people riled up in the North, go up there and say you're fixing to go get a sweet tea. 
or uh, you go to the store, and I'm going to get my buggy because I'm fixing to go get some sweet tea, right? So these are things that people don't get. There is a cultural divide. I've seen, I have students all the time where I teach on a regular basis from all over the United States because of a military base, and they recognize there are differences here than where they're from, all over the world, in fact. They recognize it. So he said, let me tell you my neurons well, well nigh cease firing. Dixie? What does that have to do with sweet tea? What kind of establishment doesn't have sweet tea? I didn't tell this Johnny definitely not a rev rocketeer where I call home. He then lectured me about the proper way to apply salt to my fries. Trust me, I can salt some fries with the best of them. Then it hit me. This man could tell I'm a southerner after speaking four words. Obviously, that gave him the right to insult me in front of my friends. In those days, I cherish opportunities to forget my home training. So I won't relay the rest of the discussion. Since then, maybe many have remarked on my manner of speech. When I moved to Texas in my early 20s, folks asked, where are you from? They couldn't place my genre of Southern twang inherited from my grandpa, Grundy County, Tennessee, to his morrow, with a draw thick enough to sop up with a biscuit. On deployment leave from Afghanistan, my family enjoyed a few days in Sunset Beach, North Carolina, where I relaxed and threw a few back with my sister and cousin. We met a group of Australians and talked to them for hours. They told me and my cousin how the ladies of the Outback would love us thanks to our accents. I'm going to consider that written in stone. My mind can't be swayed on the matter. Speechways are one factor among many separating Southerners in a fold unto themselves. As I mentioned earlier, my six years as an Army infantryman provided a whole slew of opportunities to observe the distinct Southern species. On the first day of basic training with some called boot camp, I was given the nickname Tennessee by a giant ex-football player from Alabama, and it stuck the whole 16 weeks. This is the first time I met a Hawaiian, someone from Boston, and a host of other places, but most were Southerners. It was the same when I made it to my duty station at Fort Polk, named after Lieutenant General Leonidas Polk in Leeville, Louisiana, at the time home of the 4th Brigade Combat Team, 10th Mountain Division, where I was assigned to the historic 2nd Battalion, 4th Infantry Regiment. My company's captain was a Southerner. My first sergeant was pure Louisiana. I wager his blood type was either gumbo or etouffee. My platoon sergeant, Dang near as rugged as that old cross was one part war eagle, one part long hunter, and the rest, whatever you get when you mix Alabama and red man with coffee as black as John Brown's soul. The southern fighting man is a stereotype for a reason. Of course, my platoon was populated with men who weren't southern, but there was no Yankees amongst our ranks. Shoot, the upstate New Yorkers were more rural than I was. My six-foot-four brother-in-arms raised on a farm in Iowa knew more about the agrarian lifestyle than I did. And even though we were close friends, that remained, there remained a cultural gap. In my experience, southerness is not simply a rural city divide or agrarian versus industrial. Being southern is something I recognize when I see a familiarness, even when it applies like a case of deja vu. A southerner can still spot it. James D. Davidson expresses this southern familiarness or camaraderie in his 1836 diary. He writes, quote, Mine host is an old Virginian, and when he found that I was a Virginian, he almost embraced me. The Virginian of the South or West will greet with a welcome Virginian wherever he meets him. They seem to be proud of the name. What Davidson says of Virginians, I find true of most Southerners. Anytime I spotted an orange power tea on someone's hat in Louisiana or later one stationed in Hawaii, I'd always started a conversation. In my pre-Army days, I spent a few years in East Texas, and I'm confident the majority of grunts are Texans. So I had an immediate connection with the, Texas, with the Texans in my unit mostly talking up Tennessee's role in Texas history and arguing over who could claim the real UT. Texans and Tennesseans both loved and took pride in their states. On any given day, you could find a guy in the barracks parking lot practicing roping with what resembled an Appalachian reindeer Christmas decoration as others spoke of high school football glory days, bow hunting, philosophizing about what qualifies as real country music and who they would, find, who they would fight in a hypothetical civil war. All the Southerners said their state. Like some hillbilly Jonah, you couldn't flee Southern culture in Hawaii either. Southerners can't shed what makes them Southern when they move to strange lands like some fork-tongued, cold-blooded creature. I went to a Southern Baptist church, pastored by an Oklahoman, rubbed shoulders with many Southern folk at Dixie Grill Barbecue and Crab Shack up the road from Honolulu, and danced with a few amongst rau uh, raucous country music, wranglers, pearl snaps, and cut-off jean shorts at a Nashville-themed bar in, uh, in, in Hawaii, Waikiki. As a Southerner, I've never felt alone. I learned no spray can mask that southern scent. To some, it's a repelling stench. To others, a fragment, a fragrant reminder of everything worth living and fighting for. 
You could be in a D.C. diner, Afghanistan, or Hawaii, and a Yankee might insult you because you talk funny. This puts you in a good company, my book. Or a fellow countryman might embrace you when his Dixie radar pings. Quench your mind of hiding what makes you and your people distinct or consider it a badge of dishonor like some crimson Puritan letter. Southerners way, Southern ways are normal. We aren't the weird ones. I say let them keep on with their Southern studies. They might learn something worth knowing and end up like James D. Davidson is asking, Have I caught the spirit of the South? The famous Davy Crockett spirit? It's great. Um, this, this piece is just so good, and I've asked Chase to write more for us. But I love that last part of this piece. Don't be ashamed of it. Don Livingston and I have had this conversation for years, and I think that's why this thing was so good, because it, it embodies what we've talked about. People should be proud to be Southern, and it should just be something, yeah, I'm Southern, I'm proud of it. Now, there are some people that still get away with this, you know, the, the band... Uh, the Cadillac Three has a song, you know, I'm Southern and it ain't my fault. Um, and, you know, you can't, you can't change my accent. There's just a couple of great songs they do about that. And they're, they're really proud of it. And I think that's important. Talking about being proud of these things and not running away from it, not trying to hide it. I had a teacher in, uh, in uh, junior high school. She taught English. And I think I've talked about it on this show before. She talked English. She taught English. And she was from Alabama. And she talked about how she worked very hard to get rid of her Southern accent because she didn't want to be judged by it. But she was always, she was a grand Southern lady. I mean, just one of my favorite teachers of all time. Just a, a, just a wonderful lady. And loved, uh, you know, Southern literature. She was amazing. She married uh, a minister and they, they traveled around. And um, eventually, I think they settled in North Carolina. But um, just... A wonderful person, but I, it always stuck with me as I got older that she had to get rid of it because she didn't want she didn't want her son either to sound like he was from Alabama because she thought that was wrong, and that's because she was trained that way, right? I mean, it was something that she was trained because she was trying to get an education and trying to teach literature and trying to, but she never lost who she really was. Always, she, everybody thought she was mean and hard. She was the softest lady in so many ways you'd ever meet. Just a wonderful person. And um, I think that's something you just don't... Uh, people, that they, they think that somebody, because they're stern, is and because they want to teach you the right way, they want to teach you stuff, and they want you to learn that they're mean people. She was just so good. And when I read this, and, and uh, Chase actually contacted me, and he said, you know, there was a guy that contacted me. He said he was virtually crying at the end of this. It's just beautiful. This is what the Institute really is all about. All the things we published this week about Sherman and the Hunley and secession declarations did a lot with the war this week. We don't usually do everything about the war. Did a lot with the war this week, though. But this piece stands out. It really is the best part of the week. And we had some really good stuff this week. But this piece, to me, was the full expression of what the Abbeville Institute is all about. At the end of the day, this is it. What we want to do is encourage people to be Southern, to enjoy the Southern tradition and all of the Southern, all the things about it, the music, the language, the food, the camaraderie, the community, know where you're from, the political side of it, the economic side of it, which of course we can debate about different things and that, which one's better, which one's worse. I mean, is, are the Southerners right about, are Southerners right about this? Are they not right about this? We can talk about all of that stuff. At the end of the day, recognizing you are Southern. And even when he points out the guy that he knew from, from Iowa, right? I mean, there's a guy from Iowa, good old agrarian, good old farmer. But he wasn't Southern. There was something about him that just good friends. But they always had a little disconnect because Chase is from Tennessee and this guy is from Iowa. And uh, that's good. I mean, brothers in arms, good friends. You find that. And I think Southerners always had that, you know. They were always willing to be friends with people not from the South, of course. They're Americans. Uh, but that Jeffersonian tradition, this, this guy from Iowa certainly had it. But as Chase points out, there was just a little bit something different. He got along better with the Texans and the Alabamians and people like that than he did with people from Iowa because there was something different about them. They just had a common, shared background. And there's nothing wrong with that, you see. 
There's nothing wrong with any of that. It's what makes the South what it is. What's the real form of country music? Um, what literature should we, re- should we be reading? Who are our heroes? Is your hero Lee or is your hero Grant? Right? Um, if you say it's Sherman, around any self-respecting group of Southerners, they should shun you and ostracize you immediately. You should not respect anyone that says their hero is William T. Sherman, uh, the murdering uh, homicidal maniac that uh, smashed through the South, which, of course, Karen Stokes points out in her great piece, South Carolina in 1865. Some of the stuff here is just heart-wrenching. And you read this, you read this, and you think, how can anyone admire Sherman? And I say that because uh, I saw on social media the other day, somebody was, oh, yeah, I made a joke. I made a shirt uh, with Sherman on it, and it said, uh, you know, the best Southern, the best Georgia barbecue, 1864. And my response was, yeah, it's really funny to talk about plundering, and pillaging, and murdering, raping. That's funny. That's really funny stuff, right? But there was a book published in 1866 about Sherman's march through, uh, through the South. Um, and I love this, this part of this, uh, this, this particular Uh, This book, published in 1902, I'm sorry, 1902. And he published it, he said this. uh, He said, why are you publishing a detailed description of the horrors that went through Columbia, South Carolina? This is 1902, excuse me. Yeah, I said 1866, I think a different quote, but 1902. And his name is William Pleasance, and he said this, quote, The first answer is that it is due to the truth of history. The Southern writers who 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 have undertaken to write the history of the Civil War have not the ear of the world. The Northern writers of history not only for general reading, but especially if school books are notoriously unfair. They write with a strong partisan and political bias. They misrepresent the motives and principles of action of the South, and they err not simply by the by uh, they err by the suggestion of false. A second reason why this description of the obliteration of Columbia is published is that very few, except the inhabitants of that ill-fated city, have any just conception of the horrors of that night of unchecked license, of insult, and every crime mentionable and unmentionable. In the histories that above alluded to, I doubt whether the destruction of Columbia is mentioned at all. But if noticed, it is lauded as one of the most heroic actions of the most, their most admired general. But if heroic and splendid deeds deserve to be painted in glowing words for the admiration and improvement of mankind, surely shameful deeds should not be covered up, but displayed in their naked deformity to the candid judgment of an enlightened world. I, I love that because it's exactly right. Why are we doing these things? Because these things are horrible. And they need to be shown and exposed that way. There's nothing beautiful about burning a city down. There's nothing beautiful about anything that Sherman did in his march to the sea. What Chase Steely talks about is beautiful. What Sherman did was horrible. And that should be recognized as such. But of course, we don't often do that. We hold Sherman. Well, this is all necessary. Southerners deserved it. They were traitors. Treason. This is what you get out of the Northerner or the neoconservative, the Straussian, the progressive, all the Southerners. They deserve it now. They deserve to have their monuments torn down. They deserve their deplorables. They, they're subhuman. They deserve whatever they get. You see it all the time. These people deserve all the bad things that happen to them. There's nothing good that these people deserve. And so that is why I like Karen Stokes and what she does. And of course, this is about the burning of, of uh, Columbia, South Carolina, which took place on February 17th. So we published it. I, I, we meant to publish it last week. Missed the date. So we published it this week. Uh, just a great piece. And, and we appreciate everything she writes for us. Great writer, by the way. has written a lot of good books for Shotwell Press. So if you, if you like these pieces that Karen Stokes writes, you should go out and check out her work at Shotwell Press. I highly recommend it. And of course, we also had Clyde Wilson chime in this week with a Review, uh, the title is Two Southern Heroes. Um, one is Walter P. Lane, and one is Rip Ford. So um, these are really great books, and he talks about, I love the last line. He says, The settlers of Texas, most of them Southerners, turned a dangerous territory the size of France with great courage and sacrifice and against the opposition of Northerners into a rich country. This is true, right? This is, this is what 
people don't realize. The South settled the West. Even into the Mountain West, you had Southerners out there. California was settled by Southerners, many of them. Um, so, I mean, this is important. The Southern tradition is so important to the settlement of the United States and understanding of what America is that to demonize it is to demonize America. But that's precisely what the other side is doing and why the Abbeville Institute exists. We are the counterweight. If you like these things, Please consider a donation to the Institute. We can do more if we had more revenue to do things. And the, our website is just a worldwide expression of, of some of the stuff that we can do. But there are so many other things we can do to try to provide that excellent counterweight and promote the Southern tradition. Promote the best of the Southern tradition to the world. To offer that counterweight, to explain what the South was and why to demonize the South as to demonize America. I said that about John C. Calhoun, a little video we did last year. But it's true. You demonize Calhoun, you're demonizing America. But that's exactly what the other side wants to do by demonizing Calhoun. They don't like that side of America. And it's not just Calhoun and race and slavery. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the political principles of Calhoun, the idea of limited federal authority, limited executive, restrained power. When you demonize Calhoun, you're demonizing those things. And people know it, which is why they do it. All right. Hope you enjoyed this week at the Abbeville Institute. Until next time. Good day. Mm -hmm.